Welcome everybody, uh, Sean Gillens here, and we have our guest today, Brandon Wright. He's an actuary, and I'm going to pass it over to Brandon real quick to in give himself his introduction. Sure thing. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, or hello, <laughs> or whatever time frame you're seeing this. My name is Brandon Wright. I am an actuary. As Sean mentioned, I, I work at AIG um, as an actuary there, and I've, I've been working in the field for about 18 years. Wow, wow, man. Yeah. Good, good. Good, good. All right. So, um, well, first of all, this is the Coffee and Career series, right? So this, 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 this first video is on actuary science. So, well, I have my coffee. So I don't know. Do you, what do you got? You're black, yeah. you're straight black? Straight black, yeah. Black straight coffee. black? Okay. I got a vanilla latte. <laughs> With all the sugar, man. One thing about <laughs> is like it makes you think about mortality and stuff like that and so yeah. you think twice about all the things that you put into your body not really that's not all <laughs> the time true but um but you know i like to think that i that i'm healthier as a result of it so oh, that's that's good yeah i need it i need to scale back um <laughs> yeah i do i do i do and i need to also get a coffee machine coffee maker um i've been procrastinating for the last like four or five months don't ask me. So in my head, I'm like, so then how do you make coffee? Obviously, you just showed your Starbucks cup. I just thought, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, man. <laughs> I've been making Starbucks richer. <laughs> I got yeah. some shares there. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so uh, let's start out first off by just introducing what, in your opinion, what is, who's an actuary? Um, let's, sure, let's sure. Yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, so an actuary, um, I guess you want to, so like, 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 what do I, like my definition, for example, of an, of an actuary? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, I would say an actuary is a person who, um, who prices or puts a value on risk. And so risk can be any, any types of, any type of risk. Um, but usually actuaries work in the insurance industry. And so right. we're, we're putting a value on the risk of a certain insured event um but but obviously actuaries work in a lot of different fields um mm -hmm. and so uh, just generally a, a person who who prices or puts a value on risk using a bunch of tools that we've been trained to use um throughout our actuarial education got you got you got you got you got you got you i like that yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna use that <laughs> going forward <laughs> riffing man. i'm riffing i you'll get a different answer from me every time i'm asking <laughs> I think that, that probably captures what, um, you know, what I think it is. So. Right, right, right. All right, yeah. so let's scale it back. Um, uh, and let's scale it back to when you were in high school. You know, uh, what type of student were you? And what were your, what, can you even remember what your goals were, what you wanted to be? You know, how we had that, what do you want to be in 10 years type of thing? Yeah. 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 So um, I guess I'm going to, I'll go all the way back to the very first one I can remember. You know, like, it, I feel like it changes over the years as you as you kind of go through and grow up. But I can yeah. remember as a very little kid, um, I remember thinking I wanted to be a doctor. Um, and the reason for wanting to be a doctor was because people told me they make a lot of money. And so I was like, I want to be a doctor. And that was, yeah. was kind of it. Um, and, then, and then I think I ran into like some science classes, like the thing where you have to um, build a circuit and um, right, right, right. That's like with physics. the or something like that. Right. And I burned my hand, and I was like, I don't want to be a doctor anymore because I, I, you have to take science, and I hate science. <laughs> so that was that was one. And then I think um, after that, uh, like later on, middle school, high school, I think I found out about engineering. I was pretty good at math, and so mm -hmm. um, you know, folks told me that was kind of the big push. If you're good at math and sciences. Um, you should you should be an engineer because it was kind of the cool career right. at the time. So um, so yeah, math engin engineer doctor those were my two kind of aspirations. I was a I was a, a I would say a pretty good student um, in in middle school and high school. Certainly mm -hmm. excelled more at math than anything else. Um, right. But you know, also kind of had my weaknesses, sciences and, and things like that as well. So. Yeah. Got you, got you, got you, got you. Yeah, for me, and my high school was um, different perspective. It was in high, it was in Jamaica, and yeah. um, 
Yeah, I was I was always excelling in math. Um, yeah. uh, but then, <laughs> you know, you know the high school pressures, right? You, you, know, you want to like for me back then. I I I I I, I think back. I, I wanted to be cool, and so yeah. um, I I would kind of scale back how much brilliance I'm portraying <laughs> because uh, you know yeah because yeah, I was I was I was more now heavily into sports. Yeah. And so I was just like, ah, you know, then I took it for granted. You know, I remember a couple of times where like, cause I knew my mom's schedule in terms of when she came home yeah. and I would go down to the basketball court and play basketball once after school. <laughs> and then I will run back because I knew, I knew she wasn't coming home to like six, seven o'clock. So I'll run back. <laughs> and then I was just like, wipe off real quick. And I just <laughs> like I'm studying and she would walk in and she'd be like, were you studying? And she was like, yeah. And then, but my mom is like, much smarter of course so she, <laughs> she knew she knew so she used to hit me with little gems she was just like you know be careful of cheating on yourself <laughs> <laughs> you know and i was I, I didn't understand it at the time but i i did after yeah, yeah after a while so yeah. i was not necessarily the model student but um but i always knew i was brilliant but i didn't yeah you know the high school yeah. But you can do you can do both things, right? Like you can right, be, you can you can you can be excellent at school and also excel in sports and that kind of thing. Exactly, like I'm, but it, I'm sure it all comes back full circle. Like once you're older and and working, and you realize, oh, like I could have balanced these two things and still pursued a profession that that you know that you know I guess fed off my intellect at the same time while um, you know building my skills in the sports or or whatever else, right? You know? Right, Perfect. right, right. That's what I learned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so, okay. Now, let's shift it a little bit now. So, as we shift from high school and we're going to college now. Uh, for me, um, I started off my undergrad uh, wanting to be an engineer, wanted to be an engineer. Then I discovered computer science, right? And um, so, how was it for you um, shifting into college? Yeah, yeah. So sim similar thing. And I and I, I hear this theme a lot from actuaries that I talk to, incidentally, that um, they started out, a lot of them started out engineering majors in school. I So I, I eventually, after graduating from high school, went to college um, and wanted to, obviously wanted to be an engineer. And so, mm -hmm. but I actually, so I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta, right. and they have a dual degree um, engineering program where you get a degree from Georgia Tech in engineering as, and then a degree in something else, usually a science related field from Morehouse College. Gotcha. Um, so my, my dual degree was gonna be math and civil engineering from Georgia Tech. Um, so yeah, I went to school for, for, for the math degree part of it at Morehouse, went through the three years. Um, and then after my third year, I was to transfer to Georgia Tech for the engineering part of it. Mm -hmm. In the summer, in between those two pieces of my, my dual degree, um, I had my first engineering internship at, with a company that did civil engineering. Okay. And so that, that was kind of where um, I, I got a, my first kind of feel for what it would be like to be an engineer in, on a day-to-day -day basis. And once again, similar to the, um, to the, the doctor thing, the doctor um, I quickly decided this is not for me. Like I just... I don't know if it was the just the company that I worked for or just, you know, maybe that that type of engineer was not a fit for me, but I decided I did not want to be an engineer anymore. And so I just I just decided to drop the in engineering part and finish out my <laughs> degree in math. And so that's that's kind of how I ended up. I graduated with a with a bachelor's degree in math um, before before going on with my actuarial career. So. Okay. Right. When did you discover yeah. about actuary science as a or being an actuary? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't even know. I did not know about the field um, until my senior year in college. So I went through my three years of the math degree, thinking I was going to go to Georgia Tech. After I decided not to go to Georgia Tech, I I had one year left of Morehouse because I did still have like a few requirements to get um, to finish my degree out. Right. Um, so in that last year at Morehouse, um, as I'm sitting there in one of my like senior level math courses, um, not knowing what in the world I was going to do with a math degree now that I wasn't going to be an engineer, um, <laughs> that's when I 
I remember distinctly hearing some of my classmates talk about um, actuarial science, just because we were talking about what, you know, what you could do with a math degree, you know, right. what people were doing after school. And so they talked about actuarial science. I hadn't heard of it. Um, and I, I asked some questions. I'm like, what's it about? And they're like, it's ranked one of the top careers in the country mm -hmm. um, at the time. And so I, I you know, kind of piqued my interest. And so I, I did some research on my own, um, found out that actuarial science had had a lot to do with math and money, which are two things that I liked a lot at the time. And so <laughs> I, I said, let's, let's go for it. Um, yeah. it. Did some more research, but then I, it, you know, I, I didn't know how to get into the field at the same time. And so did some research on that, learned about the exam process, which I, you know, would have been brand new to me. Um, and then in the course of my research, I, I noticed that Georgia State University had a master's degree in actuarial science. And so I thought that would be a good way to, um, to maybe, you know, get some more exposure, right. get myself in the door in the field, just because it was so new to me. And I was about to graduate from college at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't have any exams. Um, and so I wouldn't have been able to, to get a job right out of college with um, just, a, just a degree in math. And so enrolled in, the, in, the, in Georgia State's Master's of Actuarial Science program and started taking exams while I was there um, and, and so on from there. So, got you, got you, got you. So I yeah. guess we have a similar path in some sense because uh, yeah. um, I then I did the same thing after graduating my, my computer science degree and I did my master's at Temple University at the Fox School of Business. And um, yeah. similarly, so it was, um, there's a better way of uh, slowly getting into the profession yeah. uh, and, and learning about insurance also. I think that was very important for me uh, to be a little bit more well-rounded. It was just, I was just a math brain. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how it applied in the insurance world. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, so I guess similar. Like yeah. that. So, all right. So we mentioned exams now. Um, so let's kind of shift there because uh, I've been getting a lot of questions from students as it pertains to navigating the exam process. No, I'm an actuary student, uh, but you're a fully accredited actuary. And so I wanted to get your perspective on the exam process, um, how it was, um, and any little, any little hints that any little gems that you can give to our audience as it pertains to, um, making their, their journey smooth, <laughs> um, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, I guess, um, you know, depending on people's level of familiarity with, with the profession, um, folks may or may not know that there, there are a series of exams that you have to take to become. Um, a fully credentialed actuary. Um, again, like just, I guess, going back to the, when I um, finished college and found out about the profession, I, I read that you had to take these exams. At the same time, I decided to go to a master's degree of actuarial science program. And I just wanna, wanna make the distinction there. A lot of times when I tell people, um, students that are trying to get into the field that I got a master's degree in actuarial science, they'll ask, do you think it's a, a good idea to get a, a master's degree or is it required to get a master's degree? Is it a must? Right. Is it a must if I haven't had an actuarial degree program before? And I'll say the answer to that is no. Really, the most important thing for getting into the actuarial field is to pass um, your first two exams, really, which, which I think is what most companies are yep. saying as the minimum requirement. And so the master's degree, though it was nice and helpful for me, it's certainly not a requirement. So I just want to make, make sure I make that distinction um, because yep. every, like I said, every time I say that, folks ask me questions, you know, if, if it's necessary, so, so not so. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, the exam process, um, I will not sugarcoat at all. And you'll, if, if anybody, you know, <laughs> It takes the time to Google actuarial exams, you know, sure enough, within a certain amount of time, they'll find out that people say the exams are hard and, and they are, they're difficult to pass. Um, and they, you know, it, it, it requires a lot of study time, but certainly it is doable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess the, the point is, you know, I, I was told after, after I passed my first actuarial exam, that if you can pass one exam, you can pass any of them. And I, and I think that's really true. Like they all just require you sitting down and taking the time to go over the material lots and lots of times. There's usually a lot of material to cover. Right. Um, so it just takes some commitment and drive to do it. But it's certainly doable for anybody that has 
has a pretty decent aptitude for for math and mm -hmm. and pretty decent technical skills. Um, so yeah, so there's a series of exams, um, varies from eight to nine exams, and some um, some computer based learning as well, and some ed yeah. other educational type experiences. Um, but the exam process is as long you you go through it, pass you know one exam at a time, and go through. And after your first six exams, you're you're an associate, six or so, depending on what the syllabus is at the time. Right. Um, and then finally, you get your fellowship after the second um, second you know, the round. second round of exams. Right. But yeah, it's, it's a tough process. Um, it takes a lot of commitment. Um, it, it, it's the type of thing that you don't want to take lightly. Um, it's, it's not the same as, you know, I was, I was smart in school. I, I got A's in all my math classes. That does not guarantee that you can pass your exams without studying. I had to work really hard to pass my exams. Um, I'm, I'm not shy about telling people that I was, um, I was honestly a third time passer on all, of, I never passed any of my exams on less than the, thir well, I passed one exam on the first try, every other exam I passed on three or, or more attempts. And so right. um, that, that's probably like on the slower end of exam progress for people. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I was determined and I decided it was something that I wanted to do. Right. And so, right. you know, it's pretty common for people to fail exams along the way, but it's, of course absolutely worth it once you get through the exam process and master the material um, and are able to apply it in your job every day it's terribly fulfilling i i do not regret for a minute going through the exam process and getting my fellowship so, right 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 yeah. i had a question yep sure flip my mind <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I can I can tell uh, that. Oh, that, that's the question. I'm, I'm pretty sure our audience would be like, well, do I have to pass all the exams before I go in to be an actuary? And mm -hmm. well, you know, I think the answer to that is, of course, no. I think, Brandon, you, you alluded to, you know, you want to shoot for one or two exams um, right. before entering into the entry level market as, as being an actuary, right? Something along that lines. Yep. Right. Yeah. So usually one or two, um, again, like the industry kind of fluctuates when I, when I started um, which was like 18 years ago when I started in the actuarial profession most companies required you to have one exam under your belt um, today it's a, it's most companies are a bit more competitive the market is a bit more competitive so most will right. uh, will want you to have two under your belt but there are certainly opportunities if you've passed your first exam and again just to reiterate I think most folks that are in the profession, understand that if you can pass one actuarial exam um then you certainly can can pass the rest of them right. with some support so yeah one or two exams to get in the door is is usually um enough if, if you have one you could, you're it's possible to get a job if you have two it's very likely that you'll be able to get get your first job um from there so. got you got you got you got you and that's what's important and also um <clears throat> uh for uh, I guess that will lead me to what I think probably the audience would probably think about, right? Yes, that yeah. means that you'll be doing work and study while you're in the profession. Um, but that's something that companies support you um, uh, through. Um, you, you wanna you wanna chime in on that or or that's that sure. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, most companies that hire actuaries understand that actuaries have this series of exams that they have to take to be credentialed. And so um, they support the actuaries through that exam process. So what does that support look like? So most companies will give you paid study time while you're at work. So if, if an average work week in the US is 40 hours, um, most, the, most companies would give you like the equivalent of two hours a day of that 40 hour work week. Um, so about 10 hours a week. So a quarter of, of your time is is spent on studying um, mm -hmm. for for your exams for the most part. Um, that's that's fairly common. Right. So study time, they give you paid. Um, usually, they'll give you paid study materials, and so study materials are are terribly helpful in in passing these exams just because right. they're really difficult. Um, the study materials sometimes will summarize the large volume of material that you have to cover and help you learn how to do the practice problems. Um, so they companies will pay for that while you're working um, right. once you've landed your job. Um, they also will, most 
companies have a program where they give you exam raises. And so after every exam, you get a raise in your salary. That's uh, which, incentive right there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think that's one really attractive thing about the actuarial career. And it's one thing that kind of sets it apart um, as far as like just pay and, and compensation goes. So actuaries, I, I've seen some graphs of, um, of actuary salaries versus other like entry level professions. So at, in some professions, you start out at a certain salary and you may get your incremental like two or 3% annual raise per year. Right. Uh, and, and you may not. Um, and so your salary kind of, I'm trying to think which direction this will be in. Anyway. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter. It coming across. Yeah, yeah, just be consistent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so your salary might yeah. increase like kind of like that, but right. with the actuarial profession, you have these um, exam raises, which which can be pretty significant levels of raises, often on top of your whatever your promotions as you're moving up within the company, and so you, the slope of your of your salary just Deeper. goes. So you, your your salary goes up a lot quicker in actuarial um, right. in actuarial careers than in a lot of other careers. So that's that's one of the things that, that a lot of people find really attractive. Um, so, got you, got you, got you, got you, got you, yeah. got you. I think you mentioned also that um, I'm I'm gonna come off the the exam pathway, but I, because I know it's such a big part of becoming an actuary, right? Yeah. And so I think you did mention earlier that. Um, the use of what you learn in these exams in your job is very rewarding for you, right? Yeah. And uh, similarly for me, as I work as an actor also. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, re you know, reinforce that point, yeah. uh, basically. Yeah, right, for so, sure. No, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, uh, the concepts that I learned on the exams, I, I, I would say that I apply every day I'm applying stuff that I learned throughout the process. And then there's like, there's continual learning as well. Sorry. I know you had another question, no, but you're good, there, you're there's good. continual yeah, learning like along the way. That's the other, like there's, we have required as a, as a professional actuary, we we're required to do continue continuing education. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you're always learning new concepts and applying them and that kind of thing, which I think is, is really interesting. It keeps it from getting, kind of mundane and from right. doing, you know, from having to do the same job for years and years and years um, without any, any change. So. Right, 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 right. All right. So we're going to obviously go to the next stage of life, which is now a typical day in the life of an actuary. Um, do you want to get your take on that? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it, so it varies for sure from company to company, from um, from type of business that you work in to type right. of business. Um, I can tell you about my typical days. And so my my role, um, I'm an, an associate vice president in the the life um, life insurance finance actuarial area. So right. a lot of words. Um, what does that mean? So my <laughs> my department and my group. Um, is responsible for making sure that the, the life insurance products that AIG sells are profitable, are actuarial, actuarially sound, meaning that um, the company is able to set aside enough money to, to fund our life insurance um, over time and that we can, can make money on it and that we're providing products that, that people need and, and that will continue to be able to be a going concern. Right. Um, and so... My department is responsible for that. My boss is the CFO um, uh, for, for life insurance for AIG. Um, and so my role really is to, um, in, in a lot of ways, make sure that my boss, the CFO, um, understands all of the things that are going on with our business, that he has a good grasp of, um, of kind of the, the initiatives that we have going on and mm -hmm. the new products that we're, that we're putting out and, and, just the value of the business that we're we're um, that we're selling, um, and so as as a part of that, it's 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 a pretty broad thing. Um, I would say on a day to day basis, I am I spend probably half of my days sitting in meetings, kind of reviewing data and and um, information um, right. that that my department or other departments have put together that kind of review and, and tell us about the, the performance of the business from day, from day to day. Um, a lot of times we, we have to make decisions about whether, for example, whether to move forward with selling 
um, selling a new life insurance product or selling products to a certain segment of, of the market um, mm -hmm. or whether to stop selling to a certain se segment of the market or stop selling a certain type of life insurance benefit or feature. Um, and so for the, we, there's a lot of data and analysis that goes into those types of decisions. And my role in these, in these meetings is to represent the, the CFO whose responsibility, like I said, is to make sure that, that, that our life insurance is profitable and that it's actuarially sound um, and to challenge and ask questions about um, some of the data that's being presented to us and, and those right. kinds of things. Um, so, so half the day sitting in meetings, reviewing data and model output that people have put together. Um, I'd say maybe the other half of the day, um, maybe a quarter of the day, um, reviewing my staff's work. And so I have uh, people that report to me and they prepare right. materials as well um, that, that relates to actuarial work. And so I, you know, kind of review spreadsheets or documents that they would be putting together. And then another quarter of the day, maybe myself um, pulling together data, um, pulling together presentations in PowerPoint that summarize data and findings that we've gathered about our business um, mm -hmm. for, for various purposes. That, that's kind of broad and high level, um, you know, so uh, okay. hopefully that, that's helpful. No, no, that's definitely helpful because I'll be the person, um, <laughs> I'll be the actor analyst that will be providing you some of these analysis or data, right? Um, sure, because yeah. I'm, I'm still an actuary student myself, right? So I'm still, right. you know, I'm still gathering this, this, all this knowledge up. Yeah. Um, yep. Right. Apologize for that. I should probably put my phone and, and yeah. disturb. <laughs> that would be a good idea. Right. Totally All right. Right. All right. So now shifting towards um, what does it look like in the workforce surrounding, um, I guess, you know, diversity? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. Um, so I'll say, I'll say this. So when I first got into the actuarial profession, I heard kind of the rumor and the, the, the reputation of the actuarial profession as being one of the, one of the more diverse professions out there. Um, and I think that might have been just based on some of the characteristics of actuarial, uh, the actuarial profession. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, I think that was based on partially the fact that, that really the only requirements to get in the door get your foot in the door in an actuarial job were the two exams. And the exams right. obviously, um, you know, aren't specifically tailored to any, um, any one um, group or any, any particular demographic. Um, mm -hmm. So anybody can take the exams and right. anybody should be able to pass the exams. So the, the theory was that the actuarial profession was the most, you know, one of the more diverse professions out there. I think if you look at the numbers, that's mm -hmm. not, that's not, that's really not true at all. I think perhaps the actuarial profession has fewer um, fewer explicit barriers to people of any background getting into the field. But the truth is when you look at the numbers, um, the actuarial profession is not very diverse at all. Um, the insurance industry itself was a, a white male dominated industry. Uh, and so that, you know, I think we have a, a good ways to go in terms of diversity. Um, the numbers for, for creden fully credentialed black actuaries, I think there are three or 400 um, in the United States gotcha. out of, I believe, um, somewhere around 35 or 40,000 um, wow. actuaries wow. in Very the country. That's, that's a hell of a disparity right there. <laughs> right. So it's, it's just, it's, it hovers right at around 1%. Um, mm -hmm. Right. I think the numbers, I, I'm not sure the numbers on other demographics. Um, I think male that's, and that's female. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. The female mix, it's, it's a bit better. But I think recently there's been a lot of study and looking into the fact that um, the, the numbers just so the actuarial profession doesn't represent the population that it mm -hmm. serves in, in the United States. And so there's, there's a lot of initiatives and stuff to try to address um, those, those kind of that disparity. Yep. Right, right, right. And so I think one of them, uh, 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 AIBA, um, International Association of Black Actuaries, um, you yeah. want to speak on um, what what they're doing? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So AIBA, the International Association of Black Actuaries, um, it's an a organization. I've been a member of it and been actively volunteering with AIBA for, for quite a while. Um, mm -hmm. The organization's mission is to 
promote diversity and pr promote and increase the number of black actuaries um, in the U.S. Um, and to promote their their successful career development as well. Right. Uh, right. So the the IBA has tons of programs that that work to address um, and and so that work to address kind of the, the barriers that we talked about to, mm -hmm. to having the diversity in the field. Um, there was a study done, I think in 2016, that specifically identified uh, barriers to entry for, for people of color, for black and Latino specifically actuaries. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I don't remember them all off the top of my head, but there were some specific things that they identified, like um, early awareness, for example, black actuaries or black people are not. Made I think we were one of those, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we learned about it after our, 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 our bachelor's, right? Perfect example. Yeah. So we, you and I and many black actuaries in the profession now learned about the career um, late in, in, the, in life because for example, we may not have had someone in our in our um, circles growing up that was an actuary or even had any idea about the field or worked in insurance, for example. So right, we, right. we learned about it late in college, whereas um, other demographics learn about actuarial profession, perhaps in high school or, or earlier. And so mm -hmm. part of what AIBA does is to try to um, get out the word about the actuarial profession to to folks at different levels in the in the pipeline to to the career, for example, gotcha. um, some of the other the other barriers that were identified related to just um, to to being able to uh, pay for um, the, like there's costs that are associated with the exams, and so right. registering for the exams themselves and then the study materials can be expensive, and so um, the study cited that um, people that are Black and Latino and pursuing actuarial careers um, often cite as one of the reasons for stopping taking exams or for um, or for for having slower progress at mm -hmm. being that they couldn't afford um, or couldn't pay for the the required study materials or exam registrations and so they they stopped so that's a couple of them but yeah I have a works to address a bunch of barriers to entry it's a great organization. Um, kind of small grassroots organization run by people like me who volunteer and are and are passionate about um, about increasing diversity within the profession. Right. Um, so that I guess there are other or so Ola I think we have uh, Ola, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So right. organization of Latino actuaries, similar, very similar organization with and their mission obviously is to promote and increase the the numbers of of latino actuaries so a couple of organizations pr promote or uh promoting diversity i'll say also so that just the professional organizations for all actuaries have have taken um a, a proactive stance on increasing diversity as well so the society of actuaries right. and the casualty actuarial society are doing quite a bit of work to um on their on their own and and in conjunction with AIBA and OLA to um, promote diversity in the right. profession. And that's good, because I've been seeing that also. So yeah. um, that's good that everybody's on board, um, realizing what's there and and how we need to fix it or correct it. Yeah. Um, Actually, yeah. so I'll, I'll just mention also, I, I just had a thought. You mm -hmm. So I talked about kind of my day in the life, and then we, we jumped to AIBA. I guess I should probably share like my experience um, like with diversity, like, you know, on, on a personal level. Okay, yeah, 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 why not? Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so the numbers say one thing, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of work being done to increase diversity. I'll say that throughout the, my 18-year career, um, I certainly have been in many situations and many meetings um, at work, um, many um, professional conferences, where I have been the only black person in the room. And so that that's kind of what, what drives me to to want to increase diversity. Um, right. I want to see more people that that look like me or look look different than me, but you know, different than the rest of the people in the room right. Um, right. when I'm in meetings and and on calls and those kinds of things. So Right, right. I think I joined I joined you uh, what six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yes, the numbers are going up, but yeah, for a while I was the only black actuary at at 
at AIG. Um, you joined and now we have, have more. Um, oh, no. So yeah. Yep. Right. Which is good, which is good. We're yep. in the right direction. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So, okay. Um, I think we've we touched on all the things that we wanted to touch on today. I wanted to kind of leave it to you, though, in terms of what gems would you give um, students as they are considering this profession? Um, in terms of, when I say gems, I mean things that can be very helpful for them um, navigating the entry, entry level market, navigating. Um, I think we mentioned one of the gems, one to two exams, right? Coming out yeah. of college. Right. Yep. Um, yep. Next thing. Go, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, one to two exams. I would, I would say certainly do not be discouraged by failing an exam. A lot of times actuaries are people who are, Thank who you. are high performers in school um, and they get, and I, I, I may have been somewhat of a case of that. I was a high performer in math and I got to my first actuarial exam and I said, I can, I can just knock this out. Um, I took it and I failed miserably because I didn't really prepare or right. know how to prepare. Um, and, that, and a lot of people find themselves in that situation. Um, so it takes a while to kind of figure out how to prepare for these exams um, and like the amount of time that you need to dedicate, what types of materials to use. Um, right. So I'd, I'd say do not be discouraged by a failure. If it's something that you want to do, um, put in the time, figure out how to do it reach out to other actuaries. There are lots of resources online um, and available in different, you know, I'm sure Sean could share, you know, let, let, yes, you, Sean, <laughs> that's Sean, <laughs> could share um, lots of resources that are available for, um, for actuaries or people wanting to enter the profession. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be tagging it with the YouTube, with the, with the video, basically. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, because um, I think, I think also, um, when it comes on to preparing, let me just make sure I say this, it's, it just hit me, so I'm just, I'm just going to say it, um, is that, you know, we had a certain impression of how we studied before when we were in state college, right? Um, for me, I was last minute. I was just like, well, all right, two weeks before the exam, let me just, let me open the book, let me just do some study. Uh, yeah. Well, I know there's more, there's different study approaches, right? But I would definitely say try and prepare and hold the discipline throughout couple months uh, before that exam and make yeah. sure that you're practicing a lot. A lot of these things has to do with how you're practicing the material because you want to go into the exam, I guess. Um, saying that when you see a question, it's, you, it's, it's a similar question that you've worked before versus it's a, oh, this is new. Uh, let me take the time to try and figure yeah. it out because you're not going to have that time, you know. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Because in, in my experience in, with the exam so far, and even when I, even when I, I, I failed, um, the main reason it was, was because, yeah, I, I look at the exam even after the exam is done, right? I can do all these questions, yeah. but it's because I'm not exam ready. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was going in, I'm just like, I can figure it out but yeah. the time is not permitting that. So you have to reach a certain level of uh, proficiency with it yeah. um, where, where it's like, you're in there. Oh, I know what to do. Boom, boom, boom. It's yeah. done. You know? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah. There are, there are specific study tips and, and ways to prepare yourself that are, that are kind of, you know, a lot of these sites that kind of share information about actuarial science will, will tell you like about, like you, said, you kind of alluded to time management during the exam, those types of things are important. Right. So I, I would say it's just not, it's not like taking a, an exam for school. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just, you should think of it like, I, I heard the analogy that um, each actuarial exam is like taking the bar. And so to become a fully credentialed actuary, it's like you're taking the bar exam. Um, 10 times. Like, 10 times, right? So. <laughs> So you should plan to study for it that seriously. You should plan to block off time and treat it almost as if it's a second job for you, you know, besides your regular schoolwork or your, um, if or you're your, if you're working your, your right. job, it's, it's that serious and you should plan to commit a lot of time to it. Um, not to discourage people from doing it, because like oh, I no, said, no. absolutely, absolutely worth it. It pays off in the end. Mm -hmm. um, other gems. Um, so I guess depending on where people are in their career. So I, I don't know if, if there will be people watching this who are who have passed their first one or two exams, 
Um, I get asked often, um, like, how did you decide what type of company did you want to work at? That's there the are, yes. for example, like consulting, actuarial consulting jobs. You'll hear, hear people talk about, talk about consulting versus um, working for insurance. like an insurance carrier, for example. Um, I tell people when they're first trying to land their first position, um, take whatever first becomes available to you. It's kind of like the COVID vaccine that like they're saying now, <laughs> take whichever one becomes avail available to you first. So if you apply for a bunch of jobs and somebody offers you a role at an insurance company work, working with property casualty insurance, go for it. Take it, mm -hmm. get in there so that you can get your exam support uh, because that's kind of the most important first step. Right. Um, after maybe your first landing, your first job, however, um, the other question that, that folks have asked me before is what do you wish you had known earlier in your career that you, that you know now? Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell people that um, I wish I had known early in my exam process um, how to identify which companies or which, which job opportunities were more prevalent in the, in the geographic areas that I wanted to live in. Okay. So for example, in the US, um, lots of life insurers are based either in the Midwest or on the, in the Northeast of the US. Um, and so I live in Texas. However, um, most of the, the life insurers are not in Texas. I happen to work for AIG and we're kind of one of, one of the only, or certainly the largest life insurance right. employer actuaries in Texas. Um, whereas property and casualty companies may be concentrated more in, in another geographic area. And so if you know that you have a strong preference for one geographical area, you might want to research um, companies that are in that area. Because after a few years in your, in your career, uh, like your first job, it may not matter. But after your first couple of years in your career, um, it's, it, you kind of have to decide which track you're going to take. If you're going to go into life insurance, if you're going to go into consulting, um, if you're going to go into property casualty, health, you know, right. or whatever. So I'd say that's, that's another um, kind of point that I like to share with folks that are thinking about or just starting out in, in the career. Um, okay. No, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's great advice because I would love to have heard that <laughs> when yeah. I was starting. Yeah. Um, next thing, I, you know, the next thing um, that I think I hit another gem, and this is based on my experience. So when I did, when I did my master's, I had a couple of exams before and uh, I asked, you know, the advice at the time was don't sit anymore. Um, you don't want to have too many exams and no experience. And I don't really like that advice because it makes you get out of exam form in terms yeah. of how to sit for the exam, you know? Um, so for those two years in my master's, I didn't sit for anything. And yeah. it made me just, it's just like starting all over again in terms of how to prepare again. I had to go through that, oh, I failed because I wasn't prepared again. You know, I don't yeah. remember how, to, I had to remember how do you prepare for these type of exams. Yeah, and yeah. so I would, I would always tell people, do not stop, just go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right. No, I agree. I, I hear that a lot. Um, and you'll probably like if folks are searching on forums on the actuarial career and people, this, this kind of topic comes up a lot. So if you're in school and you've passed a couple of exams already, they say don't, um, you'll hear people say, don't keep taking exams, you'll be, you know, over examined or overqualified for, for an entry level position. Yeah, I agree. Um, get through as many exams as you can as early as possible. Um, right. The company is never going to look at a resume of someone and say, oh, they have too many exams. Um, it, I think what I think where that stems from is so there are kind of perceptions about um, people with a certain number of exams and what your salary should be. That's um, where it is. That's but where it comes sometimes from. what's what's built into that assumption is a certain number of years of experience go with a certain number of exams. And so right. for a four exam student, one, we would say the salary is here, but that also assumes that that four exam student probably has had a few years of experience. experience exactly. Um, and so if you start out as an entry level person with four exams, you can't necessarily expect your salary to be at the level of that four exam student that has 
that has two years of experience. And right. so, you know, you, you will be paid um, according to your exams and levels of experience. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's a rewarding career. And once you get to, to the level of, of fellowship, which is the last designation, then, um, then at that point, you know, your pay will be what it is anyway. And it'll, <laughs> it, it's rewarding, like I said. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. All right, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, uh, I will close off there. Um, any closing remarks for our audience? Any, I guess, for students that are, you know, watching this video? Um, I think you, we've, we've, you've touched on the gems, but I'm, I'm going to leave it to you to close it out. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I would just say this. Like I said, I, I can't talk about how, how um, grateful I am that I was able to, to go through the exam process and become a credentialed actuary. Um, it, it absolutely has paid off. I'm very fulfilled in my job. I think that it's certainly something if, if someone is, has even the, the slightest bit of interest, I think that, that it's something worth pursuing and looking into and talking to more actuaries. I'm happy to talk to people. If people want to reach out to me directly, I'm happy to talk to people about the field. Sean has my contact info. Um, yeah. And I'd certainly encourage anyone who's interested to, to give it a try and, and just jump in and start taking an exam. But the, the, just one more point about the actuarial profession in mm -hmm. general. I think there's no shortage of demand for actuaries. And so, you know, there are lots of jobs out there. People are always trying to get more people into the field. There are way more jobs to fill than there are um, actuaries who are, who are credentialed and, and have that are going along in the process and so um right. certainly look into it um it's a it's a great field so got you got you got you thank you yeah. for that um so i'll close off there and uh you guys stay locked once again because i'll be coming with a different career in the next video all right sounds good thanks man <laughs>